So, hey, I'm Stephen Hagen, and I'm joined by Mason Lang. All right, and we're here for St. Lotus. Uh, Mason is our Chicago and in- regular Chicago invader and regular partner and villain on the uh, Discord groups, and we're here to talk about Dominar United and Unfinity. Uh, we're going to kick off talking about Unfinity. Uh, so, just a brief recap for those that don't know. Unfinity is the first of the unsets that is not just Silver Border and therefore not legal in Vintage and or Legacy. Um, They have a special thing where there's an acorn on the cards that are too weird for Vintage and Legacy and therefore not legal. Now, the controversy in this is they have a couple of their big weird mechanics are legal in some forms, and those are stickers, which allow you to basically add two cards uh, and then attractions, which are kind of like this weird location thing. Um, so, uh, Mason, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people, myself included, who just, with the constant update of new sets rolling in every month, and you have to track what set is legal in what format, because you've got three formats that are only legal online, and then paper formats, and then standard, which is basically just an online format because people really only play it on arena but maybe it's an rcq format and it's exhausting there's a little bit of a it's hard i think for some people to stay committed to reading every single card and every single spoiler when there are just so many of them Uh, i know definitely i have fallen into that a little bit i'm also a little weirded out that they decided to go with stickers and attractions being legal because when they last released an unset that had a lot more sort of grounded mechanics it's not like they were encouraging people to play with um the contraptions or anything like right. that maybe that was just too weird at the time but i know i just said changing philosophies right but that said for those that do follow there have been some nuggets that have popped out of this set so some of these cards are already making uh legacy lists for example so I'm going to start with one, and I think this is most likely on both of our list. I know we've discussed it in the, in the Discord that has been seen some legacy play, right? And that is Blank Goblin. Indeed, yeah. It's uh, one of the more popular. It was one of the more immediately recognizable cards, right? You see a creature makes more mana than it costs, and immediately everyone's like, oh, how big of a ritual this can be. I think with all the stickers, when the set finally came out, it like pretty consistently can make you four or five mana, right? Right. And Something there's like even that. a six that it can make. Um, yeah, I so it's think... A-I-O-U and Y. They have Y as a vowel. Yeah, and I think there's like one sticker that has a six word on it, um, but you you might not be able to quote me on that. Um, right. And I think there are a bunch, and there are like, you know, a fair, a bunch of fives. So as a as a former uh, winner with goblins, is does this go into a goblins deck, or is this just something you're just going to use for a ritual for other in something else? Mm. Uh, I don't think it's probably a super exciting goblins card. I think the trickiest part with this is how you manage the stickers and everything else. I mean, like right. if it, you have to work your rule system to allow these sticker cards if our it's just ruling, our current ruling for st lotus is that just like at a tournament you get three sheets at random so you get this three of the sticker sheets at random you don't get to pick your sticker sheets um you get three of the sheets at random and that's how it works at tournaments as well i uh, would just to clarify on that one what's going to happen is that you as the uh player will choose uh 10 sheets and then yeah. you get three of them at random per per match okay there we go so you you do get 10 you can basically guarantee that this goblin will uh generate somewhere between three and six mana and there's but you don't have to draft for those 10 sheets right you just get active 10 seconds okay so yeah that's really the biggest question as or that would really be the biggest uh limit for this guy so assuming that you yeah yeah so with that ruling if that's the rules you guys play with at home i mean like you know, you could play this guy. He'd be fine uh, in Vintage Goblins. One of the biggest punches that you get is being able to play Muxus. Mm-hmm. And this guy ramping you into an early Muxus is super powerful. Right. Um, also, any Goblin Recruiter stack that you can make, uh, playing this guy into a Goblin Ringleader, into a bunch of stuff off the top that's definitely going to kill your opponent. 
totally reasonable. The fact that you can cost reduce it with Frog Tusser Banneret and Goblin Warchief uh, make it even a little bit more mana efficient, even if you get a little unlucky with your stickers. Um, yeah, I imagine this is probably a pretty decent Goblin card. And then I think it's probably also got some legs and some of the other creature based. Uh, I don't want to say a storm deck per se, because I think that gives the wrong impression, but like a high right. velocity deck where you're really churning through a lot of your cards, maybe generating mana with your guy's cradle, drawing cards off of Glimpse of Nature, stuff like that. Yeah, That's something where pretty. something where you might run a um uh, like a burning tree emissary into this even, right? Where you're you're just kind of yeah. getting dude, 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 right? Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. So. And uh what, this guy's a two two, right? So he can't yeah. kill himself with skull clamp, but I mean eh, you know, you yeah, know it's a sack outlet or something in there. Get um, Paradise Mantle or something that lets you tap your creatures for mana, work a little Concordant Crossroads in there. It's kind of a fun deck. Something mm -hmm. that I enjoy immensely. So, And we're going to talk about some other cards later on, I think, that might also have some legs in that kind of deck. So, Okay. Well, what do you got for Infinity? Pick, pick, show us. Um, I cards. think out of all the cards that exist, uh, the next one that I would say I'm excited about would be Saw in Half. That is the one of the cards on my list. This I yes. like this card. Yes. Um this card has some pretty cool stuff going the, for it. The fact that this uh, card's an instant is what pushes it over the edge. Oh yeah, huge. I mean, you being a three mana instant's a little tricky in the sense that if you're holding three mana open, your opponent can really pressure your mana by refusing to play into your instant. However, since this is a pretty proactive card you don't need to wait forever, but, you know, for your opponent to to take their action. Right. So, um, so three mana instant destroy target creature. If that creature dies this way, its controller creates two copies that are copies of that creature. And this is the coolest part, except that their base power is half that creature's power, and their base toughness is half that creature's toughness round up each time. Mm -hmm. Which means if you have a creature that puts a bunch of plus one plus one counters on it or something when it comes to the play, of which there are some, and then you saw that creature in half, it will take its current power and toughness and then split it in half, round up, and make two copies. Then if it then puts more counters on it, you will have two gigantic creatures. Right. Which is dope. I remember there was an example people were throwing around a lot on Twitter. Something I think that like comes into play with like three plus one plus one counters or something on it. You saw it in half, you make two two twos with three counters, and you've got two five fives for three mana. Which so is the dope. Cool, the cool thing about this is in a weird pinch, now it's not like gonna be likely, in a weird pinch, you could also just destroy one of their creatures and give them two weaker creatures. So if you had if they had something big that you're gonna have trouble dealing with and you just need it to be a little smaller. Um, that's something you could manage. You could do that, but most likely you're using this as shenanigans on your own stuff. Yeah, I mean, you can get dies triggers and multiple comes into play triggers off of it. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, lots of synergy, especially with the sort of um, aristocrat style decks where you've got Zillaport Cutthroats or Blood Artists. I know a lot of people like doing the little small ball. Um, well, what I, what I was thinking is uh, like a Goblin Welder thing with Worm Coil Engine. Right? Oh, definitely. With so you're coil. sawing a worm coil. You're getting two worm coils plus two tokens. <laughs> yep, and they're all just three three. You got so many yeah. freaking three threes. You get an army of three threes, and when those three, two of those three three dice, you get more three threes. So mm -hmm. and your creature is just already in the graveyard, so you can welder yeah. back. Can welder exactly. right back so, so so something weldery, right? Mister's workshop weldery. It's like sawing in half. Uh, worm coils seems really fun. Absolutely. So that's definitely, I think, a pretty cool card. Not a hundred percent that it's gonna see a ton of play, but it, it it has a it has a particular style of deck that it can go into, and I right. think it'll be pretty powerful in that context. All um, right. Well, my next one is very niche, but uh, it is a niche deck that has done very really well at two Saint Lotuses. Uh, we've not seen it in the Discord lately, and that is in fact. So my next card is Embiggen. E M B I G G E N. Uh, okay. Of course, if yeah. you are a uh, Miss Marvel fan, M. Biggin is a nice little uh, nod there to Marvel Comics and uh, uh, her her catchphrase or what she calls her ability when she embiggins. Uh, so it's this funny, is I haven't until watched it, the show yet. Until it, well, yeah, the comic too. Until it turn target non brushwag creature gets plus one plus one for each super type, card type, and subtype. 
Now, the funny thing about this card is the uh, design of it, making naming non-brushwag basically means that they can't go crazy with changelings. <laughs> yes, which is perfect. Uh, you need yeah. a way to balance that, and brushwag is obviously the funniest creature type. Exactly. Uh, but if you have most of your infect creatures are now Phyrexian and with another type, so Phyrexian Elf, so something like uh, Ikermir, I think it is, is a artifact creature Phyrexian Mirror. Um, huh? so it gets a plus four, plus four, uh, against, uh, for a lot of these, it's at least a plus three, plus three. Uh, yeah, I this... think, I think with the, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you yeah, off, but ahead. I think yeah. with the, Ara like, there was an errata a while ago that made basically every Phyrexian creature gain the creature type Phyrexian, which mm -hmm. is huge for this card, because basically every, uh, every creature in the Infect deck is going to at least get plus four, plus four. Ink Moth Nexus, since it's a land, is going to get plus five, plus five. Right. Um, and that's what pushes it over some of your other options, something like hitting this on an Moth Nexus. Um, so plus four, plus four, or plus five, plus five for one. You know, if it was just going to be like a plus three, plus three, obviously, why not just put a giant growth? But that ability to, at a minimum, always be a three, three, and sometimes hit a four, four, and a five, five for one mana. Um, yeah. Make, yeah. Makes it I, and I don't think you're stuck with too many plus three, plus threes. I don't right. think. I mean, at least none of the the core guys. And I mean, you know, God forbid, yeah, you want to put a Skitherix or something in your deck or, uh, you know, some, some, yeah, Sk Skitherix gets Skits ridiculous. Uh, he, yeah, he, that's he, a, he, that's the one shot combo if I've ever heard of one. Yeah. Like but, Glycerin uh, Elf is a plus, Glycerin Elf is a plus three plus or four, four plus four because he's an Elf Warrior. Yeah. Phyrexian Elf Warrior. So, yeah. So, um, I think like Might of Old Carosa is the most questionable pump spell that Infect plays, and that's right. only because it just is the only card that really requires you to kind of commit it at sorcery speed. Right. So if this comes, I think this like it's not a huge upgrade, but it is like a it is an upgrade, and it will probably just be sort of flat, you know, played across the board. Right. For the future. So. Okay. What you got? Any other um, from Infinity? Yeah, well, I also had the um, the blank goblin on my list. Okay. Uh, but then next, I've got a uh, clown car. Okay. Which this one I looked is at, but... seeing a little bit of play. Uh, he is an X costed one one, so you can play him for zero mana. He's a one one, and then uh, he's one of those classic X artifact creatures, which just always seem to be very good nowadays. I swear to God, like after Hangerback Walker got printed, every X costed <laughs> artifact creature has just been insane. Yeah, um, Stone Coil, Stone Coil, Walking Ballista, they just keep going, you know. Yep, everyone. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, roll X six sided dice for each odd result, create a one one, and for each even result, uh, put a one counter on it. And it's got crew too, so you can use the clowns to crew it up or whatever. But I mean, like, honestly, not a terrible, right? Like, the fact that it's, you know, a workshop, right? Like, a lot of the cards you want in your workshop deck, you want them to be flexible because you mm -hmm. want them to be both good with a turn one workshop, but also good on turn three or four where you've got 10 mana sitting around and you're, like, drawing off the top of your deck. Yeah. Uh, and this certainly counts. Uh, yeah, I, I think I overlooked this one. I, I read it real quick, and I, but, you know, um, no, this card's uh, definitely solid. Like, I would play this card. Mm -hmm. It's also another one of those zero drops, like I was saying with the Goblin. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew that there were more cards coming up here that also had that sort of zero drop. Uh, this adds to your affinity count if you're doing that sort of thing, but right. also with that uh, Spanish Inquisition style creature velocity playing lots of dudes deck, um, which I find very fun. Right. Yeah, no, and the, and the fact that it can make you kind of go wider too, with, you know, depends on your role, you, you know, it's pretty nice. Yeah, I mean, you can play it and have it random. Like, you can high roll on it and have you, it give you, like, three or four creatures, you know? Which is yeah. pretty great. Um, can build you a little board and then survive a wrath, which is nice, especially if the uh, overall sort of metagame for VRD trends more towards fair decks, which it probably should. Uh, interactive cards are really, really strong. Um, this card's pretty good in interactive sort of matchups, so... Got a lot going for it. It's got a lot going for it. It's very little downside. Like, very, very high floor on this card. All right. Well, I'm going to go with my favorite bad card next. And then we have, I think, one mutual that I know is on both of our lists that we can wrap oh, up yeah. with. Oh, you know. Um, right. So my favorite bad card, and this is just kind of like I was looking for things that I could see myself being weird with. I don't know that this is not an advocacy for this card being good, but I could see myself doing something with it. 
is Magar of the Magic Strings. M A G A R. Magar. Magar of the Magic Strings. I had a friend of mine who was really excited about this card for his EDH cube. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. But basically, you've got a 3 3 for 3, right? And you target an instant or sorcery in your graveyard, and it comes into play as a 3 3 creature. Um, and whenever that creature does come as a player, you can copy that card, the noted name, right? And you can cast that copy without paying its mana cost. So, like, it's you take a removal spell, uh, just Doom Blade, something doesn't really see play, but you, t- you, mm-hmm. you pay three mana, your Doom Blade basically becomes a 3 3 creature that every time it deals combat damage to a player, you get to Doom Blade something. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny. I, when I read this card, I two things one it's offensive to me that a face down creature is a three three and not a two two i'm sure as a judge you can appreciate that that's super messed up obviously shouldn't exist but the other thing is i think of it like a lot of these kinds of cards that when it deals damage you sacrifice it to cast the spell Mm -hmm. right but that's not the case it just keeps casting it over and over again so yeah and if it would be in the battlefield you exile it right but you know the spells that's fine but uh but yeah, so you are, you know, whatever spell, whether it be a sign in blood, something you're going to draw, a lightning bolt, you know, like mm-hmm. if they don't, if they don't block, if that's a lightning bolt and they don't block it, it's going to get, it's going to get ugly quick. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it really doesn't take, it's kind of just, it's one of those cards, it's like, it really doesn't take a lot. Basically, any spell that you're going to play is insane, right? Right. Time walk, boom, infinite combo, Magar, the magic strings, we broke it. But, right. uh... <laughs> I mean the time warp, right? Like how bad does your time warp how bad does your time walk need to be when it's a two card combo? Oh, that's right. a great question. Um So yeah, this is this is my bad card that I could see someone doing something silly with. But I've also yeah. been really in lately into red black big mana decks and thinking about ways to, you know, generate lots of big mana in red black. So uh this is uh, yep. one of those cards yep. that appeals to me in that. <laughs> Absolutely agree with you. So let's come down to, I mean, really the the premier Unfinity staple, I would mm-hmm. say, and coming forward. Comet the Stellar Pump. Yep. Okay. It is a planeswalker. Yeah, cut through all the red tape. Comet is here to party. Four oh. mana, five loyalty planeswalker, one ability with way too much text, just the way we like it. <laughs> And it's got dice and it's got dice rolling. All right, and so you we're get rolling it, you a six sided. And if we get a one or two, we uh create get plus a two loyalty. Squirrel. Well first we get plus two loyalty. Oh yeah, you're right, you're right. You and that. so we're so if you get a one or two, you're create you're protecting yourself with a higher loyalty and with two one one squirrels that have yep. haste. That have haste so, and can attack right away. So you are aware too, you've got a massive amount of protection. Because not only did you just up your loyalty to seven. But yeah. you gave yourself so two much. blockers. Yeah, so. So uh, if you roll a three, you go down minus one and return a card with mana value two or less from your graveyard to your hand. This is the mode that gets you in the most trouble because it's right. the basically the only one that you can hit that isn't going to just sort of always be good, right? Regardless of context. Yeah. However, your... the fact that it can grab any fetch land helps a lot. Right. But this is probably your worst mode, particularly on your first roll most time, you know. Right. It's certainly like you can find you can imagine yourself on board states where you play this and you go to activate it and you're like, please anything but a three. Right. Um four and five is like the best one, yeah. which is insane. Uh deals damage equal to the number of loyalty counters on him to a creature or player, and then minus two. And that's so a nice that's start. a really nice design that the minus two happens afterward, right? Yeah, and they really give themselves that room considering the way the card is templated. Right. Uh like you know, it doesn't really matter when the loyalty is coming in or something. And then so all that, it takes nice. is one six to get crazy. Yes. I mean that four or five, so the squirrels have haste. Comet, if you roll a four or a five, so a one, a two, a four, or a five is going to be damaged the turn you play it, which is right. pretty likely. Also, a six is probably more results right. of one, two, four, or five. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. One six, and you're just going off the hook, right? Like you yes. roll one six because you get to roll two more die. <laughs> Absolutely, and he's at six loyalty, so any four or right. five is now hitting for six. And I mean, like you know, this hits players. Yeah, you can clunk someone for five or six. Or maybe more, and attack them with the squirrels. I mean, 
huge amount of damage coming out of Comet. I actually really think this card is very, very good. I know some people are a little skeptical about a four mana sorcery speed card in your red white. What what does a red white deck even look like? However, I do think that um, I would have in my red white deck that went six and one. I would have ran this arc. Absolutely. And red white's a really underexplored archetype anyway. The red white yeah. archetype is very good. You have a lot of really powerful cards in it. Yeah. Whether yeah. it's it, particularly if you're in a heavy if there's a heavy creature draft, like it, you just you know so much so many answers to so much stuff yeah heavy combo drafts too i mean you have thalia yeah. and eidolon which are two of the best two drops you could possibly play into most combo decks i mean yeah. if they don't single-handedly win you the game on the spot they are at least going to slow your opponent down in a pretty significant way where they're going to be searching for their unsummon they're going to be searching for their removal spell and be searching for their wish to try to get out from underneath the the crippling pressure of that card yeah, so, so I know just like Minx and Boo, this one is seen play in Legacy already as well. Yeah, well, oh, Minx and Boo, my God. <laughs> you want to talk about wild, crazy, uh, adorable animals coming to murder all your enemies. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that is it that? for the unset, right? Um. Yeah, uh, nothing really else. I mean, there. Are, I, I will caveat the rest of the unset by saying it is possible that some of the attraction openers are good mm -hmm. or maybe that's too generous maybe playable right. lifetime holder most dangerous gamer or something like that they look to be the best ones maybe playable but it's a soft maybe and right. i and, would have and, to, and, someone else would have to do it i don't have to right you're, you're gonna that. have to do the study for that right that, mm -hmm. someone's gonna have to study hard and figure that out so I sounds agree. like a brandon job if i've ever heard of one get um, on it I agree. <laughs> All so that right. brings us over to Dominaria. I feel like we were just in Dominaria, man. I know, oh I know. A, but a couple of years back. But this set, um, you know, is the truth for VRD in a lot of ways. This set has a lot of depth and a lot of really good cards for VRD. I agree completely. I think my short list when I breezed through was maybe 12 or 14 cards or something like that. All right. Well, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Well, I want to throw out a couple of honorable mentions, if okay. that's okay with you. Or do you yeah, want to do yeah. the thing where we do it right before our number one? So um, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it before our number one. Okay. All right. Let's talk about number five for me then. Okay. I'm going to go with Nishoba Brawler. Ooh. Not yeah. I, I, I like wanted it. to, I, you know what? I almost specifically picked cards that I knew you weren't going to pick. So. Okay. <laughs> Sweet. Um, Nisho Brawler, a friend of mine, immediately slotted this into his domain modern deck and has been absolutely loving it. It is a star three where its power is your domain. Okay. It's got trample and it only costs one and a green. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy. Okay. With fetches and triumphs, uh, you can very easily get this guy to like be a five three on turn two. Mm. Um, Triumphs being a this card synergizing with those is particularly nice because triumphs are not super contested. No, as far they're very as they're very underdrafted. They're very low drafted. And you can cert that domain is a little bit of a tricky mechanic to work with. Uh, a lot of VR deck VRD decks wind up. Uh, Mark was saying online earlier, pretty too colory. Lots of basics um, working. Mm -hmm. so this is certainly something you would have to consider. Something you mm -hmm. would have to work for. However, being the fact that it costs one and a call is makes it surprisingly easy to cast in those situations, because really all you need is, you know, a, any of the green triomes and then whatever other land in your deck that you can draw. Mm -hmm. And threatening a five power trampler is pretty nice. Um, mm -hmm. You can pump this guy up. He holds equipment really well. He's super cheap, super easy to cast. He's kind of like, I would consider him like a much more consistent Tarmogoyf. Right. To bring out on turn two. Okay. All right, um, like and if you like playing aggro decks, if you like pressuring your opponent like I do, you always want a big, a big trampoline boy. All right. Speaking of aggro, I'm going to start off with an aggro card, Squee Dubious Monarch. Oh, I kind of thought you might go for this one. Um. So now the problem with this card overall is that it's going to be competing with two of Red's really good threats in uh, two other goblins, right? It's going to be competing Rebel with... Master and... Yeah. Uh, 
Legion Legion Warmoth. Legion Warmoth, guy, right. So yeah. it competes with those two. Um but it's a little bit different of a threat. Those play really well in kind of control shells where you're going to kind of drop them and let them build an army and kind of control the board. Uh, this one is comes down as a hasty guy and re- immediately makes a goblin. Um, and so the other part, you know, it's probably never going to come up, but it does, but it, it could. Um, but you're, he does come down and immediately make a goblin and start turning sideways, right? So if you go turn two or three, you drop him, and then you drop a war boss. Uh, I had this happen to me, actually. Um, it gets pretty ugly pretty quick if you can't deal with it. So, it, you know, it mm-hmm. is a um, it's a good threat. It's a nice hasty. It, it fits in that. Its only big downside is it's competing with, with Layla and two other, like, really good red, three red, red drop red three yep. drops so yep i mean you even have uh krenko tin street kingpin the mm-hmm. other the other three mana goblin um yeah, this guy's a little bit slower those other guys have compounding damage effects that roll over turn after turn uh right. that really shorten up the clock whereas squee is just sort of an incremental uh gainer but he does escape out of your graveyard, which is nice. It gives mm-hmm. you a little bit more of a resilient threat than those other guys. Those other guys really don't like sweepers. Squee is a little bit like, okay, you play me and I don't win as fast, but I'll win sort of eventually. Right. And one of the ways that I always talk about vintage history draft is this concept of the long game that no one really thinks about, mm-hmm. or at least most people approaching the format for the first time don't think about. They think of vintage as a super explosive format, these decks as being super combo-oriented, and, and the game's ending super quickly. However, the flip side of that is that when you have these sort of high-speed train decks running down uh, at each other, any sort of derailment can leave you with a you know 400 tons of steel sitting on the side of the tracks, not right. going anywhere. And in those kinds of games, Squee is really going to help you out. I I really like keeping some kind of inevitability, some kind of grindiness in my deck, mm-hmm. uh, or in basically any draft that I'm in, because I want to have something going along. I want to have a mana sink. I want to have some durability. I want to have something to do when my opponent is disrupting me, because they will. Yeah. I always say that, you know, the format is either really fast or really slow. There's not a lot of middle ground. <laughs> you know? Right. And how many times are you like, oh, my God, my super awesome deck. And then you're in a slap fight with like a Snapcaster Mage and a Goblin Engineer. And you're like trying to attack your opponent for three damage. I so mean, often. Cause, <laughs> right. Because I, I draft a lot of engines. And if I don't get the right part, then my engine falls apart. Right. Exactly. So. And when the fail state for your card is like, OK, well, it's, like, it's like a 2-2. I can kill Planeswalker or whatever with it. That's really good. Like that's that's great when you're when your high side is i'm killing my opponent and your low side is uh, i can at least attack and, and put some pressure on it's a good place to be in squee does give you that it's also i mean i would also say between krenko and layla and your two rabble masters and squee we're kind of at like that point where with where you can just do the mono red stompy thing that is very popular in Legacy in mm. VRD. The only issue is you need more like ancient tombs and city of craters. You right. can use Crystal Vein and you can use cards like Chrome Mox and things like that. Really try to go all in on that strategy, um, which I think is interesting. I don't know if it's good. I, I've been really big on Tomb lately, so Ancient Tombs moved up into one of my favorite cards. So in the format, agreed. Tomb is fantastic all right Uh, so what do you got for your first share here my first boy oh no my second guy here right yes uh sarah paragon okay um shout out to my boy davis phillips playing uh sun titans and modern since 89 (laughs) um so this is a four mana three four flyer Mm -hmm. that once during each of your turns, you can play a land or cast a card with a CMC of three or less, or mana value of three or less. Sorry, right. <laughs> CMC, what kind of boomer am I? Uh, and when you do, it gets a perpetual ability. Is that what they call it? Okay. I, when it's, it's put into the that. graveyard from the battlefield, exile it instead, you gain two life. So basically, right. you play it, and then you can just play stuff out of your graveyard, right? Like Luris, like Sun Titan. Yeah. Um, Luris being the more prime example because that card was actually good. 
Yeah, there was some um, early like people trying to argue about this card didn't work the way it's supposed to, and some rules foo. But the jet, but the uh, the all the rules bosses said the card works like you think it's supposed to work. <laughs> Perfect. I love it when magic rulings come out that way. Yeah, yeah. there was something just... weird with this card where it wasn't working on arena or something, and they're like, right, "Wait, right, is right. it a problem with arena or is it a problem with the card?" Yeah, Shit. it was just it was a the problem. The wording is a little off on how on how the ability is given, but they're like, "No, it works how you think it's supposed to work." Just shut up. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I think this card is very interesting, and I I wanted to say it right after I said that whole big spiel about Squee and grindiness and going long. The part that actually really interests me about Sarah Paragon is I think about all of the different cheapo little cards that people have been playing in Modern when Luris was legal that are very interesting in vintage history draft. Cards like Nile Spellbomb, mm -hmm. um, cards like Mishra's Bauble, uh Anything that sort of picks up value the first time you play it nice. and can threaten to sort of bury your opponent if you can toolbox your graveyard. No, that's nice. Um, that's nice. Obviously, I, I, it kind of goes without saying that there are tons of different little creatures that you can play. Totally, whatever, that's fine. But I think you've those are your... obvious. I think, I think your value play there is, uh, is, is smart and sexy, right? Like, that's... Mm -hmm. The other ones are pretty obvious, the little creatures. Yeah. And then... It also, again, gives you all your land drops back if right. you want. You can go as long as you want. Also, three four flyer is a great body. Mm -hmm. um, you really aren't. You're probably not topping that on rate with most cards you would actually play in this format. So I think the card's pretty interesting, and it would not surprise me if people actually looked at this card and wanted to draft a different kind of deck than they That's would normally think about. Okay. Um, almost like a Mardu style junt deck with okay. Sarah Paragon, or a Naya style junt deck with Sarah Paragon, really uh, acting as a Jace the Mind Sculptor esque man of uh, it, it does let you replay your Goblin Rabble Master. <laughs> let you replay Goblin Rabble Master. Uh, Caterberg lets you replay uh, Lotus. That's yeah. kind of nice. You get you get it back once. Mm hmm. Uh, all right, so my next one is a four mana card as well, and it is a planeswalker, um, Jaya Fiery Negotiator. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't. I wouldn't have expected this one to be on your list. Tell me about Jaya. So Jaya comes in with four loyalty. Not a bad place to start. And you up ticker plus one, and you get a one one red monk creature with prowess. Right. So. Um, I think the ability to create uh, a lot of red monks or a lot of little monks with prowess is is automatically pretty good. Um, you know, Monastery Mentor, uh, you know, sees a lot of success in VRD. Um, so, but if you're already kind of casting spells, you know, Young Pyro, you're adding more to it. Um, Definitely. You're, you're minus one. You get to exile the type two card to your library, choose one of them, and you may play that card this turn. So you're getting some kind of card advantage here. Um your minus two is you choose target creature and opponent controls. Whenever you attack this turn, Jaya deals damage to the number of attacking creatures to that creature. So it's kind of a first strike, you know, so you pick a creature and you just attack. And she deals damage to the number of attacking creatures on attack before any damage is dealt. You get to do damage to something. Gotcha. Cool. And then the emblem, whatever, I, I don't, I'm not even, you know, her emblem's fine. It's whenever you cast a red instant or sorcery, copy it twice, you may choose new targets. But if you're getting the minus eight, if you're getting to the emblem, you're already winning the game at this point. Yeah, I imagine the <clears throat> the winning point for this for this guy is after you have two monks and you're, like, untapping to attack. Right. Yeah. So you exactly. play it on four, you go make a monk, turn five, you make a monk, and then turn six, you're like, down tick, find me a spell, play three or four spells and then attack you for like 10 damage to my monks yep kind of interesting it's a little slow maybe but it's not it's not bad yeah it's interesting it certainly is a chunkier kind of threat than most of the red planeswalkers are like this card will give you a lot more value than like chandra torture defiance will mm -hmm. chandra torture defiance just threatens to put a little bit more direct damage upstairs um yeah. and so i was gonna say more damage upstairs but i guess most of the red planeswalkers that are i guess you would call them playable um like make mana that's like a big thing that red planeswalkers always do between cloth and between chandra torch defiance and even some of the three mana little chandras right um whereas this one does not make any mana but both its plus and its minus are just like making giving you more material to work with 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not convinced it's like super good, but uh, it's a very chunky threat. I mean, I can't really give a bunch of praise to Sarah Paragon for being a really chunky card advantage <laughs> engine, and then totally discount Jaya. Uh, and and it, uh, she jumped out at me. She may be a stretch. I don't know. But when I first saw her, I said, "There, I think she's got some legs there. I think there's something there. I know a lot of my friends were excited about her uh, for spoiler season. So uh, in a lower powered format, I would say. Oh, like an MRD or an LRD? You know. Yeah, like an LRD, something like that. Um, where you're really maybe looking to play like a chunky red midrange deck. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you can play that kind of a deck in a VRD. I suspect not. I suspect you would need more haste. If the monk's token, if the monk tokens had haste, would that help? I'm actually not sure. But fire blast gives you prowess triggers for free. Okay, everybody remember that. <laughs> all right. So what else you got for us? Okay. All right. Next one. Uh, I've I've got a card, but it's simple, and then I've got a slight tangent. Okay. And the card is tear asunder. Uh, the green spell with the black kicker. And it's got a fairly simple text box, unlike some of these cards. Uh, two mana, it uh, exiles an artifact or enchantment, so a little bit better than naturalize. And then if you give it the old kicker, you get to exile a non-land permanent instead. Yeah. Fairly simple, very fairly clean design. However... The rant is that green-black removal spells are a premier aspect of the VRD format that are not respected enough. People should be taking Abrupt Decay, Assassin's Trophy, Males from Pulse, and then a card like this so, so highly, and they should try to get every single one of those effects into their deck all at once, and it does not happen, and people don't respect it enough. And it okay. makes me angry. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but this this will be another in that line of incredibly good removal spells. Uh, most of the time, you're going to be very happy with it being a two-minute instant. And right. then every once in a while, you're going to kick it when your opponent plays a big Planeswalker on you. You're going to kick it, and you're, you're fine. Yeah. It some seven drop creature or something that they reanimate you're like oh nice crystal brand let's exile it and make sure it gets out of here forever so you don't just go back to reanimating it later okay yeah Um, that's that's good super super good card uh the fact that it exiles and goes around um indestructible also very very nice a lot of those spells that i literally just talked about all destroy which is not ideal terra sunder being an exile effect just makes it it really gives it a unique niche in that deck where you're willing to pay the four mana for it. Because whatever is coming down before that, you can use your other removal spells on. By the time you need to use Terra Sunder to get rid of that really obnoxious thing, that worm coil engine that your opponent's trying to split in half, mm-hmm. you don't mind paying the four mana for it. Um, cool. And obviously, we've seen people really get into the black discard spells. And the next level is just these black green removal spells. It's, I mean, if you start with one, you're going to want the other. But, I mean, these cards plus Vindicate should be going, like, really highly every single draft. And they're not. Or they don't usually. But they should. All right. Well, my next one is a combo card that I tried in... uh, was it in a V or is an L? I don't remember. But um, I tried, and the deck was explosive and crazy. Um, but it didn't quite get there. But I think there is a build out there for it. And it combos particularly with one card. And that is Maria Scholar of Antiquity. I thought you were going to say Vesu- Vesuvian Diplomancy. Damn it. No, All no, right. No. no, that's okay. Um, Whatever the other thing. Yeah, so Maria, uh, tap an untapped non-token artifact you control, add green. And then tap two untap non-token artifacts you control. Exile the top card of your library, you may play it this turn. So the key with this is you have um, Paradox Engine. Sure, so whenever you play a non-creature spell, you get to untap all your artifacts? Yeah, or or your mana dorks or whatever. So basically, you're tapping your artifacts for uh, exiling cards, and then and for mana, then you play those cards, and you untap them all, and you keep doing it, right? And so yes. I had... I played, there was on a god hand, a really good hand, I played my whole deck on turn four. Um, okay. That said, Fair. 
it is, you know, I had a lot of mana dorks in mine um, that made it fragile, right? Like, I did not have the build. I was also doing some Urza stuff. I did, you know, I was doing Rug. Mm -hmm. I did not have the, I had an explosive build that did crazy stuff, but it had too many engine parts. But I think that, you know, somebody can, this card is too potentially powerful for not to that combo is too potentially powerful for somebody not to keep trying it and to eventually figure it out and and find its spot right or maybe it is maybe it just requires too many parts and it will never find its spot because of that but um it is definitely frightening and explosive when it goes um mm -hmm. but as i said one of the biggest things is you to get the paradox engine down quick you probably need a lot of mana dorks and that makes it fragile to a lot of common sweepers so yeah, I mean, on the one hand, it's a little frustrating that it's non-token artifact because they've been giving us so many ways to make treasures and clues and food. You really mm -hmm. want all of the. You really want it to be like an Urza where you can get all that mana. Oh my god! Like, if it was to, if it was token artifact, this card would be so yeah. busted. <laughs> but I will say one thing that's kind of unique that this card has going for it is that the blue or the green mana that it makes has no restriction on it. You don't need right. to only cast artifacts or green spells or whatever with it. You can, you can do whatever you want with it, which is nice. That's actually kind of um, unique for this kind of card. Like a lot of the yeah. time that would come with some caveat on it. And to be fair, if you were looking to put a lot of non-token little artifact creatures onto the battlefield, red and green are good colors to do that in um i will say a card that would jump out to me like for this would be maybe like experimental frenzy mm -hmm. um because you can imagine that every card that you would want in your myriad deck is also a card you would want in your experimental frenzy deck right. and then you would actually just be picking off lands and stuff off the top of your deck um with myria whenever they come up so that you can just keep going off and you would play a ton of zero drop artifact creatures. You would play Gaia's Cradle. You would probably want to get Tolarian Academy in your deck. Yeah, you I had Cradle. I had Academy. Affinity I, creatures. Yeah, I had Cradle um, Academy, but I didn't have all the Affinity creatures, you know. So that would be. You know what? I bet the best thing to do with this is. Ooh, actually, really cool idea. If you make a bunch of shitter Affinity creatures. And then you tap a few of them, or you tap some of them, to either cast a big green sun zenith or an eldritch evolution to find mm. crater hook behemoth. Because there's a bunch of affinity creatures that cost a ton of mana, mm. um, but you can play for free. So you get your mirror enforcer down, you uh, eldritch evolution it away, or, oh, even better, birthing pod, right? Because birthing mm -hmm. pod's an artifact anyway, huh? Yeah. Do some crazy, like, See, I turn I one mission it, workshop, tap it, birthing pod, boom. I combined it with Raga Draga and tried to make make my uh, mana dorks into aggro, but I like the way you're thinking there, so. I think, I will say, I've been wanting to mess around with birthing pod and affinity for a long time, because... There are multiple Affinity 7 drops that you can go directly into Crater Hoof with, mm -hmm. and Maria could probably fuel that, but I'm not sure. But it feels like it. Okay. Also, there's probably something cute you could do with Paradox Engine and Birthing Pod, where like you get multiple Birthing Pod activations in one turn, Yeah. Um, but you'd have to find non-creature spells for it. Right. I'm not uh, actually a hundred percent. It's just spells. It's not non creature spell. It's it's just spells. Oh, paradox engine is any spell. Yeah. Any oh, spell. that's really cool then. Yeah, yeah. So that actually works really well because you can just play any shitter creature. Yeah. Untap. Boom, boom, boom. You're going. Yeah. I mean, that sounds spell. pretty cool to me. I would be interested in that a little red green affinity action. Yeah. And I mean, like, the best part about that is that despite having a really stupid kind of synergy pile, your cards really aren't. Okay, I can't say your cards really aren't that bad on their own, because they, a lot of them are really bad on their own. But you have so many big powerhouse cards, and you really only need one of them. You really only need a Myria or a Experimental Frenzy or a Birthing Pot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And any one of those can really tie a lot of your other engine stuff together, which is interesting. And yes... I would play Glimpse of Nature in that deck. <laughs> Obviously, it's the best card. Why wouldn't you play it in every deck? Um, 
cool card though. I actually, I actually, this one is growing on me. I think it's actually pretty neat. All right, all right. Well, what do you got? Um, next, I am going to. So there are going to be a few shout outs that go in this sort of general direction, but I'm going to go with Urtai. Okay, this was uh, one that was right on the edge of my list, but didn't make it. So I'm glad you, it's on yours. Yeah. Well, I figure you name a multicolored card, I'll name a multicolored card. I keep just copying you. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so. In the last two St. Lotus VRDs, I have played Mono Blue, and Venser is like a fixture of those decks. And Urtai is like the new Venser. So he's a four mana flash creature, three two. When he comes into play, you can either counter target spell activated or triggered ability, and you let your opponent draw a card, or you can destroy any creature or planeswalker, and it's controller draw as a card. Right. So. This card's so good. <laughs> It's fantastic. So the obvious downside is you're sort of gaining a little bit of extra power. You're gaining an extra point of power, and you're gaining a little bit of flexibility where you can destroy planeswalkers and creatures and things that have kind of already been in play. And instead of just bouncing back to your opponent's hand, you're getting rid of it completely, but you're letting your opponent draw a card. So it's a little bit uh, of the difference between like a removal spell and a bounce spell. Um, but if you're playing like a Narset, it plays super nice then, right? Absolutely. I was about to say, but you've got Hole Breacher as a three mana flash creature, and you've got right. Narset, and you've got the other one that people Notion play. Ghost yeah. and Thief that people don't play, but they should. But I won't say they should because it's not probably great, but it's sometimes. another four drop with flash. Right. So. Bada bing, bada boom, Aether Vial is already great. Now you can put Aether Vial and send your Aether Vial up to four and have Venser and Urtai and Restoration Angel all rolled up into one. You're already getting insane Aether Vial value on three mana with yeah. all the Brazen Bars and the V-Clicks of the world. Now you're also getting insane four mana. This has been drafted uh, once already, Mario? and it, it blew me out. This card destroyed me when it got in, yeah. in the draft that it got picked. So it's, that it's pretty three cool. power is also so attractive. It it hits so hard. Um, yeah. a one on all accounts. Honestly, I don't feel like there's too much to say about it. There are some cute things you can do with this. You can you can style. So there's a deck that I'm really really attracted to right now. Um, and it's uh, Stifle Knot. It's Phyrexian mm -hmm. Dreadnought plus Stifle, right. or you Uro and then Stifle the Sacrifice trigger. Yep. And I will say, Urtai can also Stifle Knot. You can you can find ways to uh, counter or destroy your own stuff for value and draw cards off of it, which gives you even a little bit of added flexibility. Plus, right. it gets plus five, plus five off Embiggen, and doesn't everyone like that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, my next one actually plays well with a previous one, Jaya. Um, oh. And that is Balmore Battle Mage Captain. Balmore Battle Mage Captain. What the heck does that do? This is a red and blue mana for a 1 3 flying bird wizard. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, creatures you control get plus 1 plus 0 and trample until end of turn. Ooh, so it's kind of like prowess for your whole team. Prowess for your team plus trample. Interesting, and it even pumps itself, and it's a flyer. It's a, yeah. it's it's the classic flample with multiple yeah. forms of evasion. Absolutely love it. Your, your butt doesn't get bigger, but you are, mm -hmm. you know, every spell you are aggressively making your monastery mentors or your whatever giving them trample and making them, you know, just a little more potent. Mm -hmm. So the, it's not any non-creature spell. It's specifically instant or sorcery, and right. it's not like those cards from the I, Strixhaven, I think, where everything that would copy uh, would also trigger it. So it's just right. you have to cast the spells. You have to old-fashioned mm -hmm. cast the thing. But you can get probe. You can snuff out. You can fire blast. You can you know chain some cantrips together. And really, right. you only need to cast a couple of spells to give your you know, two, three, four creatures, enough power to just kill your opponent outright. Yep, it doesn't take much. Yeah, I mean, it's not a super crazy card, but you could just see it slotting into a bunch of decks that people just already play, right? Exactly. I mean, the blue-red spell deck is very popular and it's very it's a, strong. This is a quiet killer, right? Like, it goes in with the Sprite Dragon and with that stuff like that, right? And it's just going to make them all slightly better. 
it's you know it's going to be a cog in the machine that you're never going to not be happy to see in that deck yeah you know the other thing with those blue red decks is that very often um by sort of the nature of all the cards that you put in your deck you're going to have that high velocity where you're playing you know you're tapping out you're spending all of your mana every turn to play spells but you're really not dropping that many cards out of your hand you're going to keep untapping with four or five cards in your hand every turn so this card you can kind of build turn over turn right you can play four you can play two or three spells uh in a turn where you play it and then you can still play four more spells next turn um and being a one three flyer itself or two that's going to give itself trample and pump itself is just you know it is a really good rate yeah, I mean, you don't need that many other creatures in play. I mean, if you have right. one or two other creatures in play, this card's going to kill your opponent. Yeah, um, it gives something like a Murktide it it can... like Murk Trample, too. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. Uh, Flample, again, always right. love to see it. But, um, yeah, I would say the Trample is more useful in more... Okay, the thing is, the Trample is going to be the most useful in the matchups you're going to have the most problems in, which is... It both sounds good, but it's actually not as useful as it could be because it's it's good that it's at its best when you need it because the matchup's going to be kind of bad for you. Matchups where your opponent's coming up the ground, they're blocking your creatures, right? Right. Which the blue red deck, depending on composition, sometimes uh, depend. Okay, I'm not making a lot of sense here. Depending on how burn heavy you are, you only need to rely on your creatures to get in so much damage for you. But mm -hmm. if your deck is like mostly creatures and cantrips, you're going to be relying on your creatures to deal most of your damage. Matchups where you need the trample, where your opponent's putting a lot of creatures in front of yours, that's useful because it's a way to actually get damage through. But yeah. you're going to find yourself uh, having trouble keeping up enough creatures to continually punch damage through. Uh, and the fact that she has. It's yeah. something like red, white, blue, where you're those. those uh... Monastery Mentor tokens have prowess as well, right? So they're getting bigger from prowess and getting bigger from this with the trample. And and those oh, are yeah. going to be, become little survivors. Oh, yeah. Then you're doing it. I mean, Jesus. God. Yeah. yeah. Can't lose at that point. I, they, they would be so large. Uh, I imagine if you can assemble the big wombo combo. Right. Um, Of all those cards or, coming together. Or swift spears with trample, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of interesting too, right? Like maybe this is more of one of those like, oh, I'm mostly playing a red deck and I'm splashing blue for just like a few things, as opposed to what a lot of people do where they play mostly blue and they just splash a few red things. Right. Um, I will say, and this is just a minor note, um, people who do that shouldn't do that. Um, because if you're going to play almost all blue cards and then only splash red for a few different like threats and creatures, um, unless your mana is really, really good, uh, you shouldn't splash one and two drops that you always want to play on turn one and two. You're actually better off playing red and then splashing a couple of blue cards right. that you really don't care if you cast them as the last card from your hand, right? Like your Time Walker, your Recall, or whatever. You can play all the rest of your stuff, and then eventually when you get your blue mana, you get to do the thing. I Small also... tangent, but obviously anyone who watched me in the last St. Lotus watched me never ever draw red mana for 19 turns in a row, which is hard. <laughs> All right, last comment on this one. I also like this with a rabble master, because uh, just giving rabble master trample is who you know, and he's already swinging big. Oh, definitely, yeah. Rabble master loves trample. Okay, well that is and my that likes two. other creatures. Um, perfect. We're at number that was number okay. We're so we're up to number mention. one, which means, um, which means we need to get a couple of honorable mentions, mentions in. Okay, and my honorable mentions are gonna go. Hilarian Terror, which okay. is the new quote unquote Merc Tide, uh, the big fat serpent that gets cheaper yeah. for every instant of sorcery. I think in your graveyard, yeah, and he's got graveyard. ward, right? So, so I like this guy, but I like the one from um Baldur's Gate better that uh also counts your stuff that's in exile, right? Right, yeah, agreed. Uh, that one is probably better, but if I recall, I think that one costs UU and like five. That's true. Um, uh, so UU that, and seven. Oh, UU and seven. So this guy uniquely gets all the way down to one mana, which is nice. Touché. It Touché. might not be the best. Right. It does require you to keep your instance and sorcery in your graveyard, which with cards like Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time and Snapcaster Mage and Jace, Friends Prodigy, 
you have a lot of incentive to get those cards out of your graveyard. Right. Not the best. It's also, and uh, for the next card that I'm going to pick, I think I did pick Swiftwater Cliffs, but that's on a side. Sorry. Got distracted by the chat. Stun locked by chat. Um, the other honorable mention that I was going to put all up was Haughty Jin. Okay. Uh, which, God, now I'm terrified. I'm going to accidentally say a card that winds up on your list. <laughs> no, it's not but uh, Haughty Jin, uh, standard all star, costs blue, 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 has star power, where blue, blue, star blue. is the. It's not even blue, blue, blue. It's blue, blue, one. Oh, it's blue, blue, one. Oh. I'm yeah, thinking of Tempest Jin. You're That's thinking of Tempest Jin, who is the standard all star previously, yeah. Um, but so yeah, huge, big old dummy thick boy. And huge makes your instant power. sorceries cost less. Which is crazy. I honestly, before rechecking a lot of these cards to do this review, uh, did not even know that it did that. It's actually insane. Um, the only reason it's on my honorable mentions list, and not just like very high on my list, is because it does kind of fall in the unique spot where when you're looking when you're trying to figure out how you want your blue deck to win the game, mm-hmm. there are a lot of avenues that you can take. And staying mono blue and just playing like Delver esque beatdown creatures is not typically what I would go with. I think okay. you're incentivized and you're rewarded for going into another color and moving moving outward a little bit. I don't think Haughty Jin is necessarily what you're incentivized to do, but if you think it's going to be tough to break into another color, if you're kind of wondering how, like, what threat package you want to present to actually win the game, this card, all the blue flash creatures, Vindillion Click, etc., do a lot of work together. Fantastic. Well, I, got um, honor- I have an honorable mention here in the form yeah. of a cycle minus one card. <laughs> uh huh. And that is the Lord Cycle. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm glad we're talking about it in the honorable mentions because this could just this package of cards, which I was also going to talk about as a cycle, could have just been my number one. Right. Um, the Goblin Lord, the Elf Lord, the Merfolk Lord are insane. The other two kind of suck. Social but... Lord's, Social Lord's playable. Those Cleric Lord's bad. Right. Like Fair. just because clerics are just bad. Like the Social Lord's fine. Um, it, it, the Social Lord gives you the Lord temporarily. And then that same thing we talked about later, earlier about you know having plays for the late game when it go, when it stalls out, like the ability to pay five exile it and then put a one one counter on every soldier you have. That's fine. The problem with the soldier lord is that mostly at that point you're probably want to be playing humans anyway because humans are just going to be better. So it's just a bad, it's a bad type. Yeah. Now they are printing a bunch of new soldier stuff in the next set, which could yeah. be could warrant this guy another look, but. The Merfolk, Elf, and Goblin Lords are so so good; it doesn't yeah. even matter. Like, exactly. get this card into the into the dollar rare bin. Who cares? Uh, all three of these other guys are premier level powerful, and they happen to find themselves in tribes that are already playable. super super playable. Right. Merfolk probably the least because of the same thing I just talked about with Hottie Gen being that with blue you have a lot of different ways you can choose to win the game. Merfolk not going to be the best all the time but it's yeah. possible yeah, elves but... and goblins are actively so so good in brd oh my god but like, Tribal the, merfolk, the fact that merfolk has flash and then turns every merfolk you have into a hex catcher uh is pretty phenomenal yes. and then the, the goblin Absolutely. um you get card advantage when your goblins die uh which is just great and then the elf, you have to pay a green, and you get to draw cards every time you cast an elf. So add a tax to your elf, and then every time you cast an elf, you get to draw a card. Absolutely. And you know why the merfolk uh, is a step down from the other two? Uh, the merfolk lord, his ability centers around you sacrificing your merfolk to counter your opponent's spells. The right. problem is, when you're playing merfolk and you're countering your opponent's spells, you're doing so with the intention of delaying your opponent from uh, furthering their game plan so that you can kill them. Right. Problem is but you're exactly sacrificing merfolk. your clock to do so. So However, unless you have one of the weird merfolk that makes like tokens, you know. Right. Uh for the goblin and the elf lord, however, they play into themselves perfectly. Yeah. Um good analysis. The uh goblin and elf lords just reward you for making more mana and sacrificing your own stuff. 
Uh, and goblins have a ton of super effective ways to sacrifice their own creatures with Skirk Prospector and Sling Gang Lieutenant. Um, it basically lets you roll your goblins into more goblins. You've got Persist, you've got more Mog War Marshal, you've got Birders Red Cap, you've got Muxus, you've got all your little shitter dudes, you've got Food Chain Goblins, you've got Aristocrats Goblins, you've got just giving all my goblins haste and rolling them into beating my opponent down because it's a two mana lord. It's just every part of the buffalo. You're yeah. you're absolutely in love with this card. It even costs one in a red as opposed to costing red red so that it gets a discount off of your uh off of your goblins that yeah, yeah. that reduce mana costs, which is just absolutely insane. Right. And cool. the green one, I mean, is a little bit more self explanatory in the fact that it's just make more elves, make more mana, draw more cards to do the whole thing over again. All right, well, we're coming in just over an hour here, and I've got to get to bed here soon. So oh, let's go ahead and go point. to it, our number one. Get it. I want to hear it. Let's go. My number one is the the card that is plaguing standard right now, Sheldred the Apocalypse. Oh, my God. That's not what I expected you to say. Okay, well. I love um, it. No, 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 I think this great. card. I think this card is so good. Um, in I, I want to cast this card and cast something like a burning inquiry, uh, making you draw three, it, it, making where I get a draw and gain some life, and then you're going to draw and lose life, and then discard your cards anyway. Uh, I want to play this in a wheels deck. Uh, I just want to play this even in a deck where it's just a threat, where I've got a four or five death toucher for four, and every time you draw, every time I draw a card, I get two life, and every time you draw a card, you lose two life. Even if I'm not playing into wheels, I think this card is a really aggressive stat line that is massively playable, and it is an answer that's just going to run away with the game. Absolutely. Um, Yildred, yeah, I definitely wanted to talk about this card's great. Like I said with Sarah Paragon, I think Shieldred actually gives you a little bit of an incentive to draft uh, a different kind of deck, mm -hmm. which is to say a very flat uh, interactive deck, uh, a Jund-esque style deck where you're just looking to grind your opponent down into nothing and then beat them with whatever you have left over. Like a Tarmogoyf or like a Shieldred. Shieldred does a ton of work. And it's got a little bit of that flexibility where it can protect you in matchups where you're really getting pressured a lot. Right. Uh, or it can finish your opponent off really quickly like a Goblin Ravel Master can. So you get to... Um, it gets to come down and either catch you back up or finish your opponent off. It does both really well. And I think it's just a nice, meaty threat. I wish it had literally any other keyword than Death Touch, but it's fine. Yeah. Even menace, even yeah, menace. Yeah, I, I, I would prefer menace over that touch. <laughs> um, but I really, really like this card, and I think it uh, incentivizes you a little bit to just really not, not, uh, not shy away from wanting to play just many, many interactive spells and stick around with whatever kind of threat left over you want to find. I, I would love to play this as opposed to something like a four mana Karn in that deck. Mm -hmm. because I feel like that's the direction most people move, and I would rather just have the, the meatball as opposed to the sort of like uh, esoteric synergy card where I'm drafting all these sideboard things. Like, give me simplicity. That's what I want. I want simplicity. I want Tarmogoyf. I want Shield Red. I want, I want my removal spells to be doing my work for me. All right. All right, well, okay. what do you got? Um, if it wasn't going to be Shield Red, it is Leyline Binding. Um, Leyline Binding huge, not only in its CMC, but also in its impact on modern. You said a standard all-star. Yeah. I'll bring up the modern equivalent. Yeah. Um, six and legacy mana, as well. And legacy. Uh, six mana, flash, domain, costs one less for each basic land type, so you can get it all the way down to one mana, and it enters the battlefield, exiles any non-land permanent until it leaves the battlefield. So it's a Flash O-Ring. It's fairly simplistic on its stat line, but, I mean, Flash O-Ring is like, right. hell yeah, are you kidding me? Like, let's go. I mean, um, one one um, Triome brings this to O-Ring. Exactly, then and with one any more amount of land work, brings it further, you know? Yep, absolutely. So super easy to get down to one mana. Like, people do it all over the place. Um, 
it's in it's an incredibly good interactive spell and also if you want to do some weird cascade stuff or something i actually think we might see some cascading rhino type stuff uh mm -hmm. break into vrd pretty soon okay. i think that overall strategy is very very good and uh all the cascade cards are great so it wouldn't surprise me if we saw some ley line binding breaking into those decks and also just more three four five color control decks um okay. or uh I should say, or really any beat, any domain beatdown deck too. You've got Nishoba, you've got the Territorial Kavu, you've got, yeah, you're crashing with Rhinos, you've got it all. Um, Leyline Binding. Fantastic card, though it is really kind of like Field Red. It, the beauty is in the simplicity. Right. That's great. Okay, well, uh, so these are, and, and I do think in Dom, there are, are, I know for both of us, there are a lot of cards here that I, we think are playable that we didn't get to. Um, you know, it was a pretty rich set, I think, for VRD in a lot of ways. Yeah, there were there were a few more that I had. Temporary Lockdown, shout out, that card's very good. Yeah, um, uh, shout, Vohar Vidalion Desecrator, shout out. So, oh, um, yeah. Um, all kinds of good stuff in this set, yeah. and I think it's going to continue to show off and have all kinds of little cards pop up. Oh my god, I forgot I was going to troll everybody by going off about some random common. <laughs> oh, pretend that that was my number one card. I'm saving that for all the right. next set review now. All right. All right, Mason. Well, we appreciate you joining us today. Um, so once again, this is I'm Stephen Hagen. I'm Mason Lang. Thanks for letting me join in. And we are, so we will have another set review coming up here at some point soon where we go over um, the Warhammer decks, um, which are interesting in their own right. And then also talk about the soon to be released Brothers War, which looks as equally interesting as Dom United to me. Ooh, so, yes, it does. <laughs> so a lot, lot, to, lot to look forward to there. All right, folks, thanks for joining us. Uh, this will be up on YouTube as well here uh, when Mark gets it rolling. And look forward to coming up soon to uh, the announcement about our next St. Lotus. Uh, we're, we're eyeing some dates in December. Hopefully we can get